Hi, Ron. Hey, Bob. How are you? Can't complain. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Ron Campius, the Washington Bureau Chief for JPA, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. I emphasize the middle word by way of uh, conveying the age of your organization. There are these days, increasingly few people are younger than the media organizations they work for, but <laughs> I can safely say that you actually are younger. You're, a little bit, yeah. you're under 100, right? And uh, it's about, yeah. JTA is about 100 years old. 102, 1917, that's right. So it was a wire service uh, started during World War I that conveyed right. news of interest to Jewish people and conveyed around the world via dot, 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 and dash, 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 the way Associated Press was doing, I guess, in those days. I, I, yeah, I guess. exactly. Yeah, we had like a, uh, we had uh, uh, in our old office, which was kind of downtown in New York, we've moved a little uptown, but I remember seeing the old telegraph machines still there, you know, in a dark corner of the office and not being used. But well, uh, and that was just a museum or something. I hope they didn't just sell them on eBay. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I, maybe later on I'll, I'll get up and uh, I'll show you the 1927 typewriter that we had in our Washington office. Um, Is of it that. Remington? Yeah, it is, and I think it's uh, Daniel Shore reportedly used it because he, he really, you know, yeah, he he started with the JTA back in the thirties. Did he really? Yes, he did. Yeah. Well, yeah. he was a great journalist, and he was, you know, the first generation of TV journalists were crossover print journalists. Right. He, he was a great journalist for CBS, and with all due respect for the many wonderful TV journalists we have today, I think there was something to be said for a generation who started in print. But maybe I'm just showing my bias, a bias toward my own medium. <laughs> no, I think that's, uh, I think that's right. I think that, uh, you know, you, when you have to uh, sit down and, and actually persuade people through writing every day, or at least tell a story, you, you get, uh, it, it develops certain muscles that a lot of people are lacking now, I think, especially when you have to do it at length. Yeah. So, um, Anyway, we are going to talk about the Ilhan Omar controversy. Going to go where few people dare to tread. Right. Um, <laughs> where apparently she didn't dare to tread, but, but, <clears throat> but many do. And actually, that's her point. She's saying people shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't be so fearful about treading there. Right. Um, but for, for those, if there's anybody who missed it, she, of course, is first-year congresswoman from Minnesota, one of two uh, women who became the first two female Muslims in Congress this year. Right. Um, the other being Rashida, how do you pronounce her last name? Tlaib? Is that, is that? Uh, you know, as far as I know, it would be Tlaib. Right. But uh, yeah, people here pronounce it Tlaib. So uh, uh, you know, maybe I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm sure I don't. But she's from Michigan. And, um, and so the controversy... Well, in 2012, uh, Ilhan Omar said uh, something we may or may not have time to get into, but, but, but that, that, that was controversial, and I guess she kind of walked it back or apologized or something. But the most recent two um, incidents were one where she, in talking about why a politician was supporting Israel, I guess, tell me if I got this wrong. She said, it's all about the Benjamins baby on Twitter, meaning it's all about the money. And somebody said, who were the Benjamins coming from or something? And she said, APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Um, and then the second thing was, I want to read this exactly. She got in trouble for was, I want to talk about the political influence in this country that says it is okay to push for allegiance to a foreign country. That got her in trouble and we'll get into why these things are considered problematic by certain groups and not by others. The, but one upshot was the passage of a congressional resolution. Originally, it was going to be just condemning anti-Semitism, and that was taken as an implicit rebuke of her by her own party, in effect. Right, right. Um, but then the Progressive Caucus and the Black Caucus kind of rebelled and, and uh, gave Nancy Pelosi some pushback, and it became a resolution that condemned uh, hate more broadly and explicitly mentioned Islamophobia as well as anti-Semitism. 
and uh, white supremacism and, and various things. I think it maybe even mentioned Charlottesville by name. I'm not sure, but so that was. I mean, different people are reading that differently. Is that a, who's that a victory for exactly? The resolution is it finally passed? But I just wanted to get your perspective on all of this, um, in part because you know you see it from a particular vantage point. Uh, and, you know, as I've told you before, I, you know, I, I think you're, you're, uh, an old school reporter in the sense that you try to report objectively on the things you report on and the, um, and I noticed, uh, this time around that you were, um, uh, you know, you're the, the old kind of, you know, um, retweet doesn't mean endorse, I think applies particularly to you. Because um, I think you take it to be your job to retweet things that are relevant to the what you cover from various parties. But this time I noticed that it seemed to me that overwhelmingly the things you were retweeting were very critical of, of, of Representative Omar and, um, and some maybe more than critical. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, is it, do, do I read that right? And if so, what does that mean? Does that just mean that most of the people you follow that are in the conversation you're in, and I think you follow a certain diversity, you know, it's, it's not a monolithic uh, group of people at all that you follow. Um, what, was there something like consensus that she stepped out of line and needed to uh, be reprimanded? Uh, yeah, I think there was a, uh, a consensus, you know, from what... Uh, when I when I was in Israel, we would call from the Zionist right to the Zionist left uh, <laughs> that uh, that she'd had um, uh, uh, that that she'd committed an offense because of uh, her invoking of what they thought or was her perceived invoking of the the anti-Semitic slander of dual loyalties in this particular inter instance, and then two other instances before then, she'd apologized for that. In a sense, I think uh, we'd moved past that. And certainly, like there were people who were weaponizing this against her, people who want to harm the Democrats. Um, I just finished up a story about uh, President Trump trying to use this to uh, to advance a group that uh, has as its goal the uh, uh, pulling Democrats, sorry, pulling Jews out of the Democratic Party and getting them to vote for Trump. I spoke to the head of the Republican Jewish Coalition. He said he's going to use this to try and get. Uh, uh, to move Jewish voters away from uh, Trump ahead of, sorry, away from Democrats ahead of the 2020 election. So to a certain degree, it was weaponized, but there was, uh, and and you select, as you say, I, I tr do try to get the, the range of diversity in there. There was a, uh, a reaction among people who would otherwise be sympathetic to Ilana Omar that, um, uh, that the, first of all, that this was offensive, and second of all, it was creating a huge distraction and, and sowing division among uh, uh, among uh, liberals, liberals more broadly, not just Democrats, among liberals at a time uh, that a lot of liberals perceive uh, great peril and and and, and you know and are, are trying to uh, advance with unity uh, against uh, illiberal forces. Right. I mean, there were two distinct sets of opinions. One, the latter being, um, hey, we don't object so much to the substance of what you said. APEC does use money and other things to influence votes, and some politicians respond and do adopt certain positions uh, because of this, just as uh, politicians adopt other positions in response to the various forms of pressure, including the leverage of money that other lobbies bring. But, but they said, be more mindful of the specific ways of saying things that will lead you to be accused of knowingly invoking an anti-Semitic trope. I, I, I assume, I would guess that that's kind of what Nancy Pelosi was thinking, roughly. Um, right. The, and so she got some of that. I mean, I think, uh, let's take the tropes one by one. I, I mean, as you know, the dual loyalty trope, I think a number of people pointed out that if you examine closely what she was saying, she wasn't invoking that in any straightforward way, but um, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, let's start with that. Let's start with the APAC and, and the money thing. It, it's it's all about the, you know, it's all about the Benjamins baby. Um, now, for starters, APAC, first of all, PAC, it isn't a regular PAC. It, 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 it's, um, it doesn't stand for political action committee. The PAC, PAC, it doesn't give money the way groups, way conventional PACs do, but 
it does orchestrate the giving of money. It, it's 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 it, it's al it's in touch with a lot of people, so it can direct. APAC can direct large sums of money to an individual congressperson, and I think it's uncontroversial that APAC has been known to say to somebody who's starting to uh, run for Congress, really needs money, we can get you a couple hundred thousand dollars right away, but that, like this issue or these several issues are extremely important to us, and you know maybe having to do with Iran or whatever, and um, or Israel Palestine and. And there's more a pretty explicit quid pro quo, right? I mean that that does happen. If that's what she's referring to, she's right, right? Yeah, I mean, what happens is that a regional APAC uh, official uh, will go meet, or or a national official, depending on which, will go meet with um, a candidate, uh, and it's usually in an open seat because APAC. Uh, either backs incumbents or is very wary of taking on even unfriendly incumbents if they if they don't look vulnerable. So they'll go to the uh, let's say candidate in open seat or, and they'll they'll say, um, "Here is our position. Why don't you show us your policy paper and allow us to just we won't publish it, but we'll distribute it internally and we you know we'll show it to our people." And uh, you know, years and I, I haven't seen one of these in years. Years and years ago, I did manage to see a score sheet for APAC, and they do. Uh, uh, they they score um, lawmakers both on their um, on their statements and they also score them on their on their voting records. So yeah, I mean it's it's not even as explicit as you say, but it's certainly that's the effect that uh, people know where to where to put their money. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I remember to say exactly what all five letters stand for, but it's the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Their, their right. mission, uh, I think, their official mission is to support the state of. Israel um, lately, as Israel's government went, government has kind of moved to the right, they've gotten some criticism. A number of people, including Zionists, think that supporting Benjamin Netanyahu full-throatedly is not necessarily good for Israel for a number of reasons. But in a way, that's APAC's official mandate, right? They, they support the government of Israel. Well, they would say they support the U.S.-Israel alliance. But you're right. They are in a bind because they do... Uh, they take their cues from the Israeli government of the day. And the rationale is it's democratically elected to Israeli government of the day, and we should take our cues from them. And certainly, and, and they're in their bind, uh, paradoxically, because uh, when they didn't exactly have that position was when uh, Yitzhak Rabin was uh, elected in 1992, and much of the APAC board found itself to be to the right of Yitzhak Rabin on the, on the peace process that he launched. And they... Um, they opposed them, and they really, really suffered. It was the first time in APAC's history that its funding actually went down. People were not interested in funding APAC. So they had this kind of come to, <laughs> come to Jesus. Not, not Jesus. <laughs> they come to the Messiah. <laughs> come to the Messiah moment where they said, we can't do this again. We can't openly oppose the government. And so the next time there was the serious peace process um, with Ehud Barak, and then again after that with Ehud, Ehud Olmert in the uh, mid, to, mid to late 2000s, they were on board with that. Now they're having a problem because um, Netanyahu has alienated a lot of uh, Jewish Democrats and their constituency is uh, preponderantly, maybe not, you know, at least half and half Jewish Democrats, Jewish Republicans. And so they've made, they've sent out some, some very subtle signals uh, at the last policy conference in March of last year. They explicitly endorsed a two-state solution. They said it was important to have a two-state solution. And that's interesting because both Trump and Netanyahu have retreated from uh, uh, the two-state solution, and now in this, uh, I don't, I, I don't know what the machinations are at all, but um, they've done something unusual in that. In, in addition to Netanyahu speaking at their policy conference, which is in two weeks, uh, Benny Gantz, who's the uh, most credible threat to Netanyahu in the mm -hmm. next election, is also speaking. And I, I don't remember them having an opposition leader speak right before an election. So they're, I think they're they're trying to say, you know, we're 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 agnostic about Netanyahu. We're not. Uh, mm. We're, we're not necessarily, you know, they're in trouble if he gets reelected. They're going to have to figure out what, so one way or another yeah. to live with them. But otherwise, he, he is allied with a party that is more or less openly racist to a point where even groups like APAC, not just progressive uh, groups like J Street, but even APAC is more or less explicitly condemned the alliance. That's right. Jewish power. Otsma. That's uh, he has. Uh, he is. Um, persuaded them to join with another uh, group so that they meet the threshold to get into the Knesset and then they could back him up in his government. And this is, this is a group where three of its, three of its uh, principles, I mean, you know, and they, they predictions now that they'll get seven people in the Knesset, 
uh, were openly allied with Meyer Kahane, the racist uh, ideologue rabbi who was uh, who was assassinated in 1991, I think it was, mm-hmm. 1990. In New York. Yeah. The, um, so now there is, some people have said, and I certainly think it's the case that although, I mean, the trope she was said to have invoked was one of kind of, um, you know, it was the trope of omnipotent Jews secretly controlling the world with their wealth and, and, uh, you know, and, and, and so on. Um, the, in a certain sense, I think she actually understated, maybe not quantitatively, but qualitatively, the influence of APAC, just in the sense that APAC has other avenues of influence besides money, right? Right, right. APAC will, is, you know, it has, uh, it's very influential in terms, or used to be very influential, but not, not as much anymore, but in terms of, you know, uh, what what you were like, you know, ticking off the Israel thing on uh, on their uh consideration list will look for in a in policy um they could uh the the you know the the last time they tried to do this was the 2015 iran vote uh, on the iran nuclear deal and they tried to influence democrats i mean they campaigned in their districts uh, and it was really like an intense campaign i covered the uh you know the the suburbs between baltimore and washington that have a lot of conservative and orthodox jews i covered their effort there where um uh, they were pressuring uh, Ben Cardin, and uh, and it worked with Ben Cardin. Uh, it didn't work with um, uh, what was the name of the woman who was uh, the uh, the senator at the time in in Maryland? Uh, you know the long. St- was long it st- Barbara? Um, no, uh, Barbara. Was it Barbara? Barbara? Yeah, Barbara Mikulski. It didn't work okay. with her. It did work with Ben Cardin. It didn't work overall. I mean, uh, the the Iran nuclear deal was approved, uh, essentially approved by Congress, and uh, and was and moved ahead. So uh, the, uh, the, that's been weakened, and that's like one way they have influence. The other way they have influence since the 80s, they have what they call the 50-state strategy, in which you don't, uh, you don't just give to a politician. You get to know a politician. You go into his offices. You help campaign. You help him with the issues that are dear to him, not just uh, the Middle Eastern and Israel issues, uh, and you, you form that kind of relationship. And then, you know, they have 18,000 people coming in a couple of weeks, and a goodly portion of them are going to go up to the hill, and they're going to meet every single member uh, or at least the staff for every single member on the hill, including Elon Omer's staff, I'm sure. And they will, uh, and, and that's just, uh, you know, in, in, if you've been in Washington, that's a, it's an incredible formative show of strength. It really, it, it does give the impression that they have this, uh, uh, the, the Jewish community behind them. When they and, and I gather they've been known, maybe they, this is less common now, but that they can, if there's a particular congressperson um, that, they're mad at for whatever reason. They can. It depends on the constituency of the congressperson. But let's say a congressperson with a, a, a somewhat significant Jewish constituency, they can stir up trouble in a systematic way, right? I mean, they can. They they will launch a kind of uh, public relations campaign to convince those constituents that this this congressman's not worthy of their support, right? Uh, I don't know. If APAC itself will do that. It might. You know, there might be proxies who will do that. On its behalf, certainly, um, but like I said, that they they are very wary of going up against a congressman who's likely to be elect reelected, mm-hmm. even if they're, uh, um, you know, even if if they they're alienated from Apex values because they don't want to be perceived as being weak. They don't want to be perceived as losing fights, and so the famous fights that. Uh, uh, you know, and I heard this once even stated in the full plenum. It used to be like an inside joke at APAC, and I remember some board member stated it in the full plenum about Paul Findlay, who claims that APAC was behind his ouster in uh, 1982. He was a he was a Republican congressman who met with the PLO, and um, and he wrote a whole book about it. And uh, this board member said, you know, Findlay was vulnerable, but if he wants to blame us, that's okay. Mm-hmm. So there, there, that's how they. They project strength, but conversely, they don't uh, want to go after um, uh, strong uh, in, in incumbents. But yeah, when they do, they uh, they they will go all out. They'll get their donors. They targeted uh, Lincoln Chafee, who was an Israel skeptical Republican in two thousand and six, and he says himself, "I you know yes, APAC targeted me, but I lost because it was an anti Republican year." And they went after Cynthia McKinney and Arthur Hilliard the same year. Um, 
I think that's the last time I remember APAC going all out in terms of trying to rem actually There's a, remove. There's a famous the case with what was what was his name? Percy was it? Uh, Charles Percy, also right. 2000. And, sorry, 1984. Same uh, same story. They will say you know they uh, they went all in for Paul Simon. They got they they elected um, uh, Paul Simon, not the singer, the the Democratic senator <laughs> from uh, Illinois, and uh, they. Um, Again, uh, you know, Percy was was perceived as uh, vulnerable. Both Percy and it's interesting because um, uh, Percy and um, and and um, Findlay were both perceived as uh, vulnerable because they were neglecting Il Illinois or Chicago uh, for um, you know for uh, for foreign affairs to try and like they mm -hmm. thought that they uh, same thing with Cynthia McKinney who um, uh, who was seen as vulnerable in 2002 when she lost her first race and she was reelected and she lost again. But uh, I just, I remember an Associated Press story going into the suburbs of Atlanta and talking to people and saying, was it APAC money? And they said, no, it was because she was, uh, she started like insinuating that the United States knew about the 9-11 beforehand and that we just don't want somebody like that representing us. In mm -hmm. the and they were talking to African-Americans. So, like I said, it's just every single case is a, it shows that uh, they, they do, go after the vulnerable incumbents, but that just doesn't happen that often. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it seems to me like another form of influence, uh, and I don't believe this is exercised in any kind of systematic or official way by APAC, and I would uh, here add to this, I would say it's not just APAC, it's allied groups. I mean, so for example, uh, the American Jewish Committee publishes Commentary Magazine, so that's like a Kind used, of to, used to, used to. They, they separated. Oh, did it no longer? No, they 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 parted ways. Um, I think in the nineteen eighties. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, they they were. For actually, it became kind of an embarrassment to them for a while that people were still. Oh, you know, I'm glad to hear that. I, I mean, I'm because I had thought, you know, because I'm not a big fan of commentary. I mean, commentary, I guess, is what you would say to the right of APAC. Is that right? It, it, oh yeah. Oh and, yeah. And, and I remember thinking, like, man, does the. Uh, what would Pod Horitz have to do before the American Jewish Committee said they don't want him to be their standard bearer? I, 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 maybe I was looking at an old Wikipedia article. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I, I, I think more highly of uh, AJC now um, than yeah. uh, than. Uh, um, but anyway, there there are media. I mean, you know, commentary is uh, does play the game I'm about to describe, which is. Um, I mean, I'll leave it to you to tell me to what extent it's a game and to what extent it's heartfelt. But it seems to me one form of influence exercised by at least some groups allied with APAC on some issues and, and maybe by APAC itself is to police a kind of a speech code with respect to Israel. And, and, and that's a big issue of contention here. Ilhan Omar would say this, and don't you understand, this is what's going on here. I said, about a particular lobby, the kind of thing that is said about other lobbies all the time. And, you know, they're using money to influence votes. And why is there so much blowback this time? I, I, I actually think the answer is complex, but I think part of the answer is what I suspect you say, which is there are at least some people who want to police a speech code because they do not want too much critical attention paid to the relationship between the U.S and Israel. Do you think, uh, I just said uh, too much, uh, too much to even ask you if you agree, but what, what's your um, reaction to that? Yeah, though there have been people who've explicitly said, who have explicitly said that. I mean, uh, when, uh, you know, J Street was established uh, 10 years ago, and as it's gone from strength to strength, but nowhere near as powerful as APAC, but certainly very influential now, people have said, no, you can't criticize Israel because if we're Jews criticizing Israel, um, you are, uh, you know, you're, you're giving fodder to the enemy. I mean, Malcolm Hanlein, the, uh, mm. uh, the, the professional leader of the Conference of Presidents of American Jewish Organizations explicitly said that a couple of weeks ago. I forget in relationship to which controversy, but that's what he explicitly said. Uh, and so, yeah, they, they, that's, uh, that's certainly an agenda. Now, now, of course, he, he, did what he, he didn't explicitly say we are going to call things anti-Semitism, whether we or not we believe they are, as a way of enforcing this speech code. He, he wasn't quite that explicit, right? And so part of my question is, do you nonetheless think that that happens on the part of at least um, some people? 
I don't think it's cynical. I think that they, uh, you know, they honestly believe it. They sort of hyper rationalize it on the on the on the far right. I would say the, uh, you know, maybe I could see I could perceive not in Jew, not in Jewish organizations. I I would say in a, in a publication like the Free Beacon, which has kind of taken up commentaries. Uh, more populist role. I sometimes think, I, can, can they, are they actually writing this? Do they believe what they're uh, what they're saying here um, when they call somebody "quote unquote" anti-Israel simply for being critical of Israel, or some, or, or anti-Semitic even for for being mm -hmm. critical of Israel? Uh, and um, I think that's a. Uh, um, that in those precincts, maybe it's a little bit cynical. I don't, I don't know. But, but the the point with the Elon Omar controversy is that she was sort of, you know, doing what we've done uh, here in the in the conversation for the last uh, twenty years, as the internet has sort of uh, exploded, and there are like so many more opinions that you can pick and choose from. We're picking our enemies because, we're, and we're picking our worst enemies, the people who really are bad faith, uh, in order not to have to maybe contend with the. Uh, with the, the the critics that might actually be hitting closer to home, and so the criticism here from from Ilan Homar was coming from, like I said, from people who would, who are otherwise inclined to um, to be supportive. So you know, uh, Elliot Engel, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, where she sits, uh, who has been pressured to remove her and who says he won't remove her. Uh, I know that one of the reasons he brought her onto the Foreign Affairs Committee is because he thought that she would be a really good ad in terms of uh, talking about refugees, because she is a refugee, and talking about East Africa, because she's lived in Kenya as a refugee, and she's from Somalia. She was a refugee from Somalia. So, uh, you know, and he's one of the ones who's been very, who's been within the Democratic Caucus, who has been harshest in his uh, his criticism of her. And the other, the other thing I remembered is like also the, um, you know, the the politically conservative most politically conservative Jews within the religious spectrum are Orthodox Jews, right? And so, the, but the two mainstream Orthodox Jewish organizations, Agudat Israel and the um, Orthodox Union, have worked with Omar to advance this uh, uh, this rule change that would allow people to wear religious hell head covering while sure, in Congress. Sure. And so they, you know, they see a commonality. They're grateful for her, you know, doing this. They're grateful for her being there to do this. Um, so. It, so I, you know, I think that she she's not she's not being hit by people who are you know necessarily cynically weaponizing this against her. Yeah, I mean, I had thought of there as being a dichotomy, that, and I think it is too simple in the way these dichotomies always are. That is to say, those there are people. I, I got. To, I personally do believe there are people thinking. Um, you know, we can't let this kind of discussion start. If they start talking about uh, APEC's influence or they start talking about that too robustly, people will start questioning the relationship and so on. I imagine there are people thinking that through, but uh, in that way. But, but, I, but I know there are also people at the other end of the spectrum who um, are genuinely, they hear certain words like just it's all about the benjamins baby uh even though as we said that in a certain sense understates uh, apex influence and in any event it's literally true that apex does use money sometimes to influence um things um nonetheless they hear that and they genuinely do um believe it's anti-semitic i know there are people like that and one thing I have said to you that I think is worth getting into is the way this differs to some extent by generation among Jews. Um, it took me a long time to realize that a lot of Jews of my generation, I think, and tell me if you think this is right, but have a heartfelt fear of a some truly horrific thing happening, conceivably even on par with the Holocaust, but in any event, truly horrific persecution in a way that to me just does not seem likely enough to even seriously consider. But then again, I mean, you know, I, I could be wrong, but my main point is I think a lot of us don't realize how many um, Jews, especially older Jews in America, actually, you know, for them, that's a live thing, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a live thing. And I think that, um, if you look at the, uh, yeah, I, I think that it's kind of come full circle, though. I think you're right that there's been a certain like uh, 
a dislocative feeling for Jews of a, of a, of a younger generation. They're not as close to these things um, as their uh, parents and grandparents were. But, um, and, and then they, they, they kind of synthesize what they do know, what they learned in Hebrew school or what they heard from their grandparents about their great grandparents or whatever. And they synthesize that into a kind of a liberalism that says, oh my, Muslims are under threat now. Jews were once under threat. I should defend um, Muslims or I should defend uh, immigrants because of this. And that certainly manifests. But I, I think that there's like a, uh, that the emergence of a specific threat to Jews since the election of Donald Trump, you know, and I'm saying it's correlative. I'm not necessarily saying it's causative. <laughs> but, you know, you had Pittsburgh, 11 yeah. Jews massacred, the worst US, killing of Jews in U.S. history. You had Charlottesville. I think that that really scared Jews. And, I, you know, like after I reported Charlottesville, I drove down there and, and reported it out. And I did a, a first person piece about like Nazis coming up to me and shouting abuse at me because somehow they perceived I'm, I'm Jewish. I think like all Jews look different starting. And, and then as we age, we start looking at uh, the males start looking alike in any case. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so in any case, I, and, and I, I wasn't, I wasn't amused, but I was bemused by this attention I was getting from Nazis. And <laughs> I, uh, I wrote about that in my piece. And um, the, the reactions I got on social media and, my friend, and from my friends was, oh my God, you must have been so scared. That's so awful. And I wasn't scared and it wasn't that awful, but I understand where they're coming from. They, don't, they never expected you know, a Jewish reporter to have abuse hurled at him and shouted at him just for reporting on something and to have it, to have it shouted by dedicated neo-Nazis. And mm -hmm. so I think that that is a, um, and, and, you know, and so generalize that into the effect of just watching neo-Nazis march across a town that a lot of people know who've been, you know, because it has University of Virginia, it's a beautiful little city, a lot of people have been there, and seeing it occupied for a period by neo-Nazis. And it's, uh, and, then, uh, and, Pittsburgh, and then Pittsburgh, which was like a force multiplier worse, Mm -hmm. You, I think that the, it is being internalized as a specifically Jewish threat now. And, and you know, before I want to get more into um, the, the intergenerational issue, uh, the generational contrast of Jewish opinion, I think to some extent we've seen this time around. But first, I want to finish the, the thought I was having about like, okay, so if on one side of the spectrum, there are at least some people who are consciously thinking we have to enforce the speech code, Ilhan Omar has crossed the line, and if we get too much of this, um, people will become cynical about uh, the reasons for America's support of Israel, and we don't want to see that conversation get off the ground, and so on. There's that, I think, at least some of that. At the other end, there's completely heartfelt, actual fear of anti-Semitism. And then my reading of human psychology is that there's often, I mean, people aren't completely in touch with their own motivations often, and there may be people who at some level are worried about what effect this crossing the line on some speech code will have on the policy discourse of Washington, but who don't think of it that way, even if maybe that is at some level part of the motivation, and they do have some of the heartfelt fear of anti-Semitism. So this is just my way of saying it's all very murky. You know, I wrote this um, piece that I kind of coerced you into reading for the Mindful Resistance newsletter. It's a good piece. Yeah, well, I'm glad you uh, approved. Um, I actually got a supportive email from somebody who was on the board of J Street, which I was also happy about. Um, but, uh, but, but, but there I cast it as kind of a dichotomy, and it's, it, it is more complicated than that, um, as always. So anyway, um, on this generational issue, I mean, uh, leaving aside the events that have recently maybe energized these fears, um, you know, the original or the, you know, earlier source of the fear is, of course, you know, the Holocaust. And people of my age um, and older are going to naturally be more in touch with that memory than very young people. You know, I think I mentioned to you that, that Frank Four, who uh, used to be at a New Republic, he's, he's a friend of mine, but he was on Terry Gross's show talking about his grandmother and her experience um, I think maybe this, in this case, it was Ukraine, but it was some form of persecution that led to the death of everyone in her immediate family other than her. And what an important role she had been in his growing up. And he, 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 um, he is a little younger than I am. 
Um, and, uh, but, but still she was a very, she was a very active presence in his life. And I wondered like, what about the next generation that has no contact with her? I gather there is an increasingly kind of stark, is it my imagination, difference of opinion among American Jews that is correlated with generation? Yeah, like I said, I think that's, uh, that's for sure. If you, you know, I mean, this is something that, that has informed like the whole, uh, the APAC um, anxiety about losing younger Jews and uh, that there are people who have, you know, there, there are people who have living memories of the Holocaust and they're very few, um, or at least not just the Holocaust, but even being here during the Holocaust and understanding what was going on. And those are diminishing, of course. And then there are people who uh, have, um, uh, you know, a, a larger number of people who have memories of worrying about what was going on in the Soviet Union and the repression of Jews, qua Jews in the Soviet Union, not simply for being Soviet citizens, but for being Jewish. Uh, and that, uh, you know, and so that's over in 1990, and that's the, the, and that's receding from memory, especially for people who were toddlers in 1990. And then um, the, uh, and in between, there was like the existential threat that Israel was perceived to have faced in the 1967 and 1973 wars. Those mm -hmm. numbers are diminishing as well. It becomes more abstract, and, uh, you know, people who, uh, young Jews who go to Israel, who consider Israel now see a, a country with a robust defense and a robust economy. I mean, if anything, uh, you know, the whole birthright program makes Israel attractive because it's a great, it seems to be a great and fun country to live in. You know, it's, that's the, uh, it's not the, uh, um, the scrappy little uh, Spartan survivor. It's a, it's a, it's a Western um, country. So that, uh, there's that as, uh, there's that as well. Yeah, sure. we, should, we should say the birthright program is this program that, uh, what is it, graduating high school students or what? Anyway, well, well, they've actually made it older now, but until now it's between 18 and 26, and they tailor the program depending on the age group. Uh, and you get a free trip to Israel, you get three weeks, you get tours, you get explanations from a pro-Israel yeah. uh, point of view. And, if, you're, uh, if you're Jewish, that's the quality. If you're Jewish, if you're Jewish, yeah. Um, and uh, so did you have the sense... I mean, I had the sense this time around, I mean, you know, the blowback that Ilhan Omar got was there. I mean, the traditional way of responding to the kinds of things she said, you know, still has a lot of um, power behind it. I mean, but again, not so much that that first version of the resolution passed, right? And in general, when I, just in reading the comments to, uh, in response to people's tweets and so on, I got the sense of that there was just more support for her and more opposition to the enforcement of the speech code as has traditionally been done than before by a significant margin. Did you, did you perceive that? And, and my sense was that it's young people, a lot of them are young Jews, and that this is, we're seeing something that's just qualitatively different from what you saw 10, 15, 20 years ago? Yeah, I think that's the case to a degree. And I think that's why uh, Jews are so worried about uh, this, because let's say, as opposed to Rashida Tlaib, uh, she's, um, who has, uh, you know, had the same benefit because in terms of her pro-Palestinian advocacy, Ilhan Omar is getting the benefit extended to what's perceived as crossing over into, uh, you know, anti-Semitic tropes. So I think that, that that that's what's so concerning. But certainly, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, she's um, she's a very attractive personality. She's very kind of joyous despite her mm -hmm. upbringing. She is, she is very empathetic. I mean, I, you know, you have to I have to say like the 10 minute video of that event at, um, at Bus Boys and Poets here in Washington, where she made the com comment about uh, feeling pressured to pledge allegiance to Israel. The first part of it is, is where she talks to about meeting with Jewish constituents and feeling their pain about their worry in Israel. And it's, you know, it's really clear that she, she, she felt it. She was, she was extemporizing. She wasn't kidding about that. And, uh, and then her, you know, her, um, the fact that she's a refugee at a time when, uh, you know, Trump and uh, Stephen Miller are trying to slash refugee intake to zeros. And here's one who's elected to Congress. I think that's very appealing to, um, to, to, to liberals who are, you know, are trying to, uh, to create a movement that would oust Trump and that would erase Trump's legacy. Absolutely. Every, every one of those movements, I think, makes, um, 
But as you say, also just a diminishment in, you know, the, what they call the David and Goliath thing. Israel has become the Goliath. It's no longer the David it was perceived as being in the uh, in 1967 and 1973. Um, yeah, the the uh, uh, that video, the 10 minute video, I think is worth watching. I mean, the, the um, I, I, I had never watched her for any extended period of time. You know, she's pretty charismatic and and. Um, she uh and and i was and it seemed very heartfelt to me she's clearly uh passionate about the palestinian issue i'm going to read the controversial part she says um i want to talk about the political influence in this country that says it is okay to push for a allegiance to a foreign country uh and i you know other people said this i think it's worth saying um that she is not saying accusing jews of dual loyalty again that, that is the trope she's accused of invoking she's using the word allegiance um but what she's saying is i don't want to be pushed uh toward allegiance to any country and then i mean conveniently for her purposes uh this this congressman juan vargas I mean, it was perfect. First of all, it was convenient for her purposes that it wasn't a Jewish guy who said this, right? He's right. not, it's not even Jews doing the pressuring she's talking about, but he illustrated this perfectly because he denounced her for uh, suggesting that her remark was anti-Semitic. And he's a Democratic congressman, by the way. And then he says, quote, questioning support for the U.S.-Israel relationship is unacceptable. And that's, I think exactly what she's saying. She doesn't think it's fair to say that she has some kind of obligation to um, treat Israel any differently from the way she would treat any other country uh, that has relations with America that are worthy of public debate. And um, so I I'm wondering what you think about that. When I watched the video and saw that this seemed to be a pretty spot, you know, the whole thing was pretty impromptu. Maybe she had a rough idea. She wasn't reading anything. Maybe she had a rough idea of what she was um, going to say, but as you said, it began with you know these kind of heartwarming stories about how she talks to her Jewish constituents. To my mind, it looked like this grew organically, kind of out of her passion for the Palestinian cause and her frustration with exactly what we've really seen this week, which is that if you get if you get near this territory, people scrutinize what you say very closely. And if you don't really err on the side of caution, you're going to get a ton of blowback. That's what she's complaining about here, and and it's what happened. That's my view. Do you? Am I being too charitable? I, you know, I don't think you're being too charitable. I think what maybe what's being discounted in in that scenario, and I think all that's true. But I think what's also being discounted in that scenario is that, uh, you know, passion works like wine, and in, in vino veritas, right? She gets she gets to that portion of the ten minute uh, thing where where she starts thinking about uh, Jewish power in ways that uh, she's trying to invoke allegiance. And then, of course, Juan Vargas comes out and <laughs> seems to validate her. But notably, like, you know, some of their, uh, some of the most prominent, Jew her prominent Jewish critics who are on the left, like Josh Marshall and, uh, and um, Michael Cohen, the other Michael Cohen, the Boston Globe co columnist, said, well, thank you, Juan Vargas, for screwing us over <laughs> in terms of our argument, because now you've made her case. But, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, he's like, Yes, she has to deal with that for sure. You know, if from Juan Margaret Vargas, a tiny minority within her party and within the whole polity, certainly like the Zionist Organization of America, uh, putting out those risable releases about her every week, uh, being an agency. Might for people who don't follow these things, we should say that the ZOA is way right. Yeah, right. Uh, on, the, on the spectrum of American organizations. But she has the, uh, you know, she has the room to. Um, she has room within her own caucus to to not have to deal with that. I mean, Juan Vargas is the outlier. the The people who are in who are not outliers are people like Elliot Engel or Anita Lowy or Nancy Pelosi, who are telling her, "Okay, you have your views on Israel. We accept that. It's not the views of the party, and we're not going to advance them. But we accept that those are your views on Israel. And now let's focus on on issues where we can." work together like refugees or, or other or you know famously she was uh she was at least from a, a liberal perspective she was fabulous in pu pushing pulling elliot abrams over the coals when he became the venezuela envo envoy 
and she re she was the designated bad cop who reminded him of all his bad acts during the 1980s and uh you know everybody in the democratic caucus loved her at that point because she was she did a good job of uh what she was supposed to do so um and I think that that's like the concern, like, no, you know, okay, Juan Vargas is this guy in California. I'm Nita Lowy. I'm the chairwoman of the Appropriations Committee. I'm like maybe the second most powerful person in this caucus. Over there is, uh, you know, Elliot Engel. Over there is Ted Deutsch, the chairman of the Middle East Committee. All we're saying is that don't say anything that sounds like you're accusing anybody of dual loyalty, okay? We're not pressuring you into uh, accusing us of dual loyalty. We're not pressuring you, pressuring you into pledging allegiance to anything. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, yeah, well, uh, well, is there anything else you want to say? I have one no. more reaction. Well, Go ahead. I would say as someone who, as you know, has written um, things APEC would not like, including things about APEC, um, uh, and I, you know, I've written uh, critically of, of, of Israel, um, and um, I've expressed concern about um, the way the U well, the possibility that war with Iran is made more likely um, by some of the influence exerted by um, by by groups like APAC, which, by the way, is itself wandering toward a, a third rail kind of trope. If you start talking about wars getting started and so on, so I guess I I should retract all that. But anyway, what I was going to say was, um, I, I on the one hand, um, I I have done enough of this. That in my mind, if a word like allegiance or loyalty pops into mind, even though I know I'm actually not invoking the trope because I'm not even talking about Jews, it would just my this censor in me would say, just don't even don't even bring the word loyalty or allegiance into this conversation. I I, I can understand how someone like her, who you know until recently was not much in the public eye, it's not like she was writing op eds about Israel three years ago that any of us were aware of, right? And 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 it's like. I, a, I can imagine how that that little filter is just not there, and I recommend people exercising those filters just because it, it's 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 just better for everyone if you just manage to address the substantive issues you want to address without arousing needless antagonism. But the other thing is, the the I absolutely do understand and identify with the sentiment, which is that. You know, sometimes you feel if you get out and express these opinions that are even close to controversial, that are controversial in at least some corners, and you get the blowback for them, and, and and sometimes people do focus on the speech, and you get what seems like a hugely disproportionate reaction to what you're actually saying, and some of it does come from various groups identified as pro-Israel in 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 Washington. Um, you do get this feeling like, is the assumption underlying this that I am supposed to not critically evaluate a relationship with Israel or something? I mean, I, I guess it's never occurred to me quite, in those so many words, are they, are they assuming, are they enforcing an allegiance to Israel? But I, I understand substantively the kind of frustration that she's exhibiting. That's all I would say. Right. Right. I mean, I think, you know, and I, I think that's a, um, uh, that's uh, just a. Uh, uh, I, I, I understand that frustration. I think that uh, you see, she could have definitely expressed it better. That she comes, you know, like and like like I said, that you, we we fall back on the on the tropes that are embedded in our culture, and I don't think that people need to be condemned because of one thing they said at one time. Um, you know, a few weeks ago. Uh, it came out that Rashid Tlaib had published in um, the Final Call, the Farrakhan publication in 2006, mm -hmm. and it was a completely innocuous piece. It was, I forget, it was just a community advocacy piece. This is like, this is how you go about helping yourself in terms of, you know, with the government. But um, somebody wanted me to uh, pick it up. Do we need to pick this up? And I said, you know, she hasn't had any recent association with Farrakhan. This is 2005. Look at Steve Scalise and his associations, maybe just a few years earlier, with white supremacists. We have to give people room to not be badgered by these things. You know, that whole similar argument is now playing out with Tucker Carlson, but it's more problematic because of the way that the reviews he expressed in 2009 mm -hmm. reflect the views that he's expressing now. So it's it's a bit, bit different. But um, certainly, yeah, I think that... Uh, 
people are constantly trying to set, um, and, you know, and coupled with the other things that people are trying to, to make criticism of their position taboo. The NRA succeeded for years in making, uh, uh, in, in, in making restrictions on guns uh, taboo. The word liberal used to be <laughs> you know, a bad word. Democrats didn't even want to embrace the, uh, the word liberal 20, 30 years ago. You probably can talk about that better than, uh, than, than I can. And if there's a, and it's a, it's certainly a problem within the, the, the culture. That, and, then, and then people will use the weapons they can use to try and enforce those uh, taboos across the board, for sure. Yeah. You know, just quickly speaking of the NRA, one thing I hadn't gotten until I uh, heard this from you, and it kind of surprises me, but that, you know, so, so, you know, she gets criticized for saying APEC exerts influence via money, which it does, and she says... The, the NRA does, and we're allowed to point that out uh, and, and scream about it, and nobody says anything. But one thing I, uh, you pointed out to me in an earlier conversation is that some people on the other side of the argument, on kind of, I guess, the APAC side of the argument, so to speak, find that comparison offensive because the NRA's ultimate, a lot of its ultimate support comes from gun manufacturers who are just in it for the money, right? right. Whereas, whereas supporters of Israel feel that they're in it for, because of their values, because of their ideology. Anyway, for some reason other than just to make money, it hadn't even occurred to me that that was a source of offense. Is that, is that like a widespread, like a fair number of people actually, you think, feel that source of offense? Oh, yeah. I think that, you know, that APAC keeps on emphasizing, first of all, that it's an American group. It's not an Israeli group. And they emphasize that to show that it's a citizens group, that people are, you know, getting up and they're spending money that they don't get back. That it's not really tax deductible um, mm -hmm. just to, to advance this this issue. And I, yeah, and, and, um, and we talked about that in the context of what the, the, the broader f second five minutes of her uh, that video were about, where she was somehow segueing from this whole issue with APAC into saying that she's going to take on the NRA. But there were also other bunny generating lobbies that she was going to take on like big pharma and uh and the fossil fuel industry and, and oh yes and private prisons uh and uh, you know your average conference goer to to apac would be i think very offended to find themselves in the company of those folks yeah it's interesting i mean of course the nra does have its grassroots constituency and, and constituency in fact the big source of its power is that its members will vote against people and presumably they, they donate money as well but i take your point that I mean, I guess the, the the closest thing to an analogy, and it's not a close one at all, is the fact that some on some issues, APAC, you know, on on, on some issues, uh, eh, probably not. Uh, so never mind. Uh, but but, but um, anyway, I hadn't thought about that. The the um, now on the um, you mentioned Tucker Carlson, and that calls to mind. This woman, uh, Piro, what's her name? Is it Janet? Jean Piro. Jean Piro, Piro. Yeah. This, this uh, Fox News commentator said something pretty horrible about Omar saying, uh, basically, the fact that she covers her head somehow means that she's she her existence is incompatible with the American Constitution. So it was it was a way of saying, basically. No, it seems to me the subtext was no Muslim can truly be a citizen of the United States who who really believes in the Constitution. It was a horrible thing, and it comes on the no heels, practicing Muslim, yeah, no, no practicing Muslim, and it comes on the heels of um, this thing that appeared apparently under the auspices of the West Virginia uh, Republican Party, which associated Ilhan Omar with nine eleven. It was just and 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 what I would like to. So, so what happens to Jean Pirro? Um, I guess nothing. I mean, Fox News said they had a private conversation with her or something. Meanwhile, the, and I'm wondering what you think about this. There was this guy on CNN who used the phrase, what was it? One Israel from the river to the sea or something, which. Oh, yeah. Mark Lamont Hill. Yeah. OK, yeah. so now that turns out to be a phrase that I guess Hamas uses. I mean, right. substantively, what it I guess the minimum it it must mean is one state solution, right? I mean, it, right. it means, it means, you know, all it just should be one Israel encompassing the West bank and everything. And of course that's a scenario that a lot of uh, Jews in Israel don't like at all because they figure the demographics point to that meaning a state that's ultimately controlled by Arabs and, and they lose out. But, 
on the other hand, just to, I mean, you wouldn't say about everyone who supports a one state solution that they're anti-Semitic, but no, uh, but what did you think of the what? So he was bounced. I mean, it seems to me he said something less obviously offensive and reprehensible than what Pierrot said. And she goes nowhere and he gets fired. Now, that could be just a difference between CNN and Fox. But I'm curious what yeah. your take on that whole thing is. No, I think you're right. I think it is a difference between CNN and Fox because I think that CNN is the real news organization and, and Fox is, unfortunately, with the exceptions of a, you know, a few reporters who've been named frequently in recent days, like Brett Beyer or, or Chris Wallace um, or Shep Shepard. It's, it's a... Um, Shep, Shep Smith. Mm-hmm. Shep Smith, sorry. Uh, it's a... Um, it's a propaganda outfit, you know. Uh, there, there. It's an outfit that capitalizes on, on people's fears uh, to a, to a great degree. So they're not going to, you know, as long as they're making the money, they're not going to worry about it. Whereas, uh, uh, and again, you know, I, 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 I but I also object. Uh, I find it problematic that people are so easily banished to the, um, you know. I mean, there's just for saying something, okay, you know, like the whole thing with Donna Brazil leaking questions in the debate to the Hillary Clinton campaign, that's an ethical issue. But when you used to, you know, Octavia Nasser, who's just a, simply a brilliant uh, analyst of Middle Eastern politics, after a certain uh, Hezbollah-affiliated sheikh died, she's Lebanese, and she posted a, a little tweet saying that, thanking him for being, uh, you know, as somebody who advanced women's rights in Lebanon. And and so you know every, oh but he says blah, blah he's terrorist affiliated blah 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 and then and, and CNN bounced her and I thought well you know she it was probably in politic at the time this is I don't know eight years ago I think but she, she's viewing it as a Lebanese woman who's just you know she's not mm-hmm. we don't always necessarily have to see the bigger picture you know in every th- single thing that we say so you know I think it's regrettable that probably that Mark Lamont Hill was was bounced uh, for that but. Uh, it certainly yes. It invoke it is. It's a phrase that, uh, that uh, it's, it was originally a PLO phrase, but it was in PLO in the days when the PLO also wanted to uh, uh, to drive the Jews out of uh, out of Israel. And that's the uh, that's the problem with this association. It's not necessarily that it's it's a single democratic state that he's invoking, which is I'm sure what he wanted to talk about. He was, he's talking. You're talking about a phrase that's associated with violence. Mm-hmm. And. Um... I mean, you don't know for sure that he knows the entire history of a phrase, but, uh, you know, that, that's the other reason I might have exercised caution. But in any event, um, he uh, he he didn't fare well. The um, so where do you where do you see kind of the state of play? I mean, it seems to me there have been the the the, the speech code has kind of been evolving for some time. I mean, I remember when Jimmy Carter's book came out and he, and it was, I think the title or subtitle was Peace, Not Apartheid. It was about Israel-Palestine. And I think he was explicit in the book in saying that if if Israel keeps heading down this path, it could eventually become an apartheid state. He wasn't saying it's now an apartheid state, but he got a lot of blowback on grounds that to say what he said, to put the word apartheid in the Tyler, wherever it was, was reprehensible. I don't know if the word anti-Semitic was used, but but the idea was this is off limits. You're not, I, I think the word anti-Semitic probably was used. And the idea was this is off limits. It seems to me, I have heard more and more people making casual comparisons of Israel as it is now to an apartheid state. And I'm not seeing the blowback. Is that my imagination that that, that particular hot button is not as hot as it used to be? I think that's true. I think it is. It isn't as hot as it used to be. And I think that, I mean, uh, bizarrely, I actually got a call from President Carter after that uh, whole thing, um, mm. where uh, he, um, I, th- I think it was like during, of all things, it was just on Christmas Eve or something, and nobody was working except for JTA. So he called JTA to talk about why he used it, and he regretted using it because he said he should have been more explicit that he was saying that it was something that he was like anticipating, as you said, it wasn't something that he was uh, saying was the present case. Um, so he did regret its usage. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that that's, uh, it's, it's definitely become, and you know, and it's become more commonplace because there are Israeli politicians who talk, and Ehud Barak 
you know, in 2000, I watched him on, on, on the Knesset floor saying, do you want, we could be heading towards the two states or we could be heading towards apartheid. Mm-hmm. He was a prime minister at the time. So it's, uh, it's no longer out of, as out of bounds as it once was, for sure. Yeah. Um, and so where, where, what's your sense of kind of where we are at this? I mean, I mean, I assume like as a political matter, Republicans are kind of happy that there's this internal division among Democrats and that, and some of the maybe more cynical Republicans are glad that Trump can go around saying Democrats are anti-Semitic, although I don't know how many people are buying that as a generalization, but, but I assume there's a certain amount of celebration. On the other hand, once they moved the, that congressional resolution to include Islamophobia and white supremacism, um, the only people who wrote it against it were a couple dozen Republicans, and that some people say that doesn't look so great, voting against an anti-hate bill. But right. um, what, what, what's your, I mean, this isn't as simple as like one party won and one lost, and in any event, that isn't the ultimate question. But um, what, what's, your, what's your take for the politics of this? You know, from what I where I stand, where I cover the you know the the Jewish community and and the political parties. You know, I think well, there's two things. I don't think it's going to affect affect voter out. I mean, they're going to be there might be like Jews who stay at home if this is still an issue in a year and a half. Who would have voted Democratic? Yeah, yeah, but I don't think that there are many who are going to cross over to the Republican Party as long as it's headed by Donald Trump. He's a reviled figure in the Jewish community after Pittsburgh after the massacre. Um, came the elections and and in the elections there was i think j street had an exit poll and they asked people to what degree they blamed donald trump for the uh his rhetoric for the um the uh, elements leaving leading up to pittsburgh and a, and a lot of people said yes he's partially to blame 72 percent said said that 32 percent of jews jewish voters yeah mm-hmm. jews who voted on on election day and that's like a that's a huge number um and i i just don't think that whatever Elon homer does they can uh, that can be discounted um, but it you know, might just lead to some people throwing their arms up in despair and not voting or voting for Howard, Howard um, Schultz, you know, or the third party or something like that, which could be, could, could add up to, oh, yeah. uh, to being a problem in, in swing states like Florida or Pennsylvania or Ohio. But the, um, the, and the, the other thing is, of course, like Jewish donors to the Democratic Party. They're, they're dis- they donate per- per- to uh, Democratic politicians disproportionately. Um, and the, the the thing was, when I say that, I, you have to emphasize, you know, because now Paula Page is, uh, is in trouble for saying that, but it's actually the former governor of Maine. It's actually true that the Jews do disproportionately vote, but what you have to say is that they 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 um, they donate for a whole diverse amount of reasons. It's not that they're all pro-Israel. But I don't. I doubt that even a majority of the Jewish money that goes in is, is has anything to do with pro-Israel. But there are there are specifically pro-Israel donors like Chaim Saban. Um, does this diminish, does this inhibit them from uh, giving money to the Democrats? And, you know, and then you have to factor in the fact that uh, 20 years ago, that would have been a critical question in terms of funding for the next election. Now, uh, you know, it seems so long ago that Howard Dean basically revolutionized that and, and created the party that, that uh, relies much more on small donations. I don't think it's as much of a factor as it, mm. as, as it once was. So, I mean, there's, there, there, there's all that. So politically, um, I think this is... Uh, this is a storm that could pass unless Ilan Omar keeps on coming back to it. And, you know, what was interesting is that Nancy Pelosi, after all of this, after saying she spoke to Ilan Omar about what might have been perceived as offensive and what she said, that she, she conveyed the idea that the Pelosi got it, came away from that meeting thinking that Ilan Omar doesn't get it yet. She still doesn't get it. So, you, you mean, know. You mean Pelosi said that off the record? No, she didn't say it off the record. I mean, if you if you listen, you no, know, she said it on the record. She I forget what, she didn't say she doesn't get it in quotes. Um, she says, I still, I think, she, and she used present tense. I don't think she appreciates, you know, didn't appreciate, not, I don't think she appreciates, I don't think she appreciates what, mm-hmm. uh, that was the word she used, what, uh, what harm these words can do. So, yeah. Uh, you know, so that's just, that's like a, um, you know, that's the wild card. Yeah. Uh, the, um, I mean, you know, one thing, that's going on is she's getting a lot of positive feedback from elements of the progressive base. I mean, that's what I was alluding to earlier when I said, when you look at how this is playing out, there's a lot of uh, young progressives, including young Jews who are saying it's about time and defending her full throatedly. So 
Although you might ask, man, when you get this much blowback, why would you not be a little more careful in how you choose your words? Um, I think she's getting some support. Now, it's funny, AOC got cautious. Somebody schooled her earlier, right? I mean, and in fact, there, there is some discontent among progressives on the left that she did not stand up for Ilhan Omar uh, in a very full-throated way at all. I think not to the extent that Rashida Tlaib, Tlaib? whatever, um, did. And um, so I don't know how it's going to um, play. Yeah, I mean, I think that, either, but, uh, you know, Ocasio-Cortez is also emblematic in that she explained why robustly on Twitter why she was uh, where she was because she was being consistent in her, at least according to her view, she was being consistent in saying that you know just as we live, the the first stop we make in considering offense is the targeted community, we should do that with the Jews as well. And uh, mm -hmm. and she you know and and, and defended uh, Ilan Omar, who has been the subject to Islamophobic attacks, as we pointed out, and that's uh, um, um, even though in that West Virginia case, the party eventually. Distance itself from whoever. Now, did, did the West Virginia Republican Party distance itself? From? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did from the uh, from the okay. person who put up well, that thing. Yeah, but the um, so yeah, you have that. Uh, uh, so you have that. And, you know, of course, Ocasio Cortez is from New York City. It's a it's a, it's a you know one third right. Jewish or something. It's like like or maybe not that much as it once was, but still a huge Jewish population. So that could also be a factor. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you want to say by? Um, by way of summary, or? I think we're good. I think, uh, you know, we covered a lot. <laughs> we did. Maybe too much. We'll see how much trouble we get into. But um, thank you, Ron. So people can um, follow you on Twitter, for one thing. Well, they can see your work at the JTA site. JTA.org, yeah. And are there particular pieces you've written, you have written about this, right? So are there particular ones that you would direct people to? Yeah, I wrote about it. Uh, something's going to go up soon on the uh, on whether you know whether Trump is right when he says Jews are leaving the Democratic Party. And then um, last Friday, I wrote about uh, kind of the um, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez again. <laughs> she wrote a she she wrote she sent out a fundraising appeal saying it's official. APAC is after us, and uh, it was that was based on a. Um, a New York Times story, as New York Times story continued to do, they set the agenda for the week on the, on the Monday of the previous week that quoted somebody who uh, apparently presented himself as an APAC activist, who really wasn't an APAC activist, uh, as saying, yes, we're going after, you know, Rashida Tlaib and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bilan Omar, which is, like I said, it's not what APAC does. So that, that, that explains, that piece does explain how APAC operates in detail. So oh, that, okay. that would be something to look we'll, We will link to that on the site, by which I mean the uh, bloggingheads.tv site. We also have a Blogging Heads YouTube channel um, that will not have the link, but, but on the site, if you click links mentioned, it will include that. That reminds me, mentioning Trump reminds me of a final question. You, you said that uh, he does not have much support among American Jews. He does have a lot of support in Israel, right? And what, yeah. and, and of course, I mean, there has, I guess that's part of a kind of strain there has been on relations between a lot of American Jews and a lot of Israeli Jews lately, right? Well, particularly between American Jews and the Netanyahu government. I mean, I yeah. think that the American Jews will understand that all politics is local and, you know, that Trump has done things, at least in the, you know, uh, in the um, in the foreshortened outlook that seem good for Israel in terms of moving the embassy to Jerusalem and, and things like that. But I think particularly after Pittsburgh, when you had uh, the ambassador here, Ron Dermer, and you had Naftali Bennett, who was the so-called minister for the diaspora, defending Trump on anti-Semitism at a time when the mood of the American people was really uh, not about the American Jewish, you know, people, the American Jewish community was not uh, ready to to counsel, like uh, to sort of be forgiving in the face of, of Trump. I think that's problematic. The government, uh, that, that really is the, the relationship between the Jewish community and the government's really probably, you know, I, I actually put this to an Israeli documentarian a while ago. Um, you know, the, the, the reflexive Israeli thing about American Jews talking about Israel security is you don't have, you're not on the front lines. You're not, you don't have sons in uniforms mm -hmm. going to the front lines. You don't get to make these calls. Well, you know, the reverse is true as well. And so when Ron Dermer comes and says that Donald Trump isn't a security threat to the American Jewish community, well, that's not your, it's not your call. You're not here. 
Um, if the, you know, maybe he's not, I mean, objectively, maybe he's not a threat to the American Jewish community, but don't be so easy, don't, don't be so handily dismissing of what 72% of American Jews is, perceive. Take it into consideration, understand why they, they, they think that before you dismiss it, because you're not, Ameri you're not you don't represent American Jews uh, on security issues. And so I think that that is the, um, um, that, that is the exacerbator. The, what's being exacerbated is the relationship between the American Jewish community and the Israeli government, not so much between American Jews and Israel, yeah. I think. Well, that reminds me, one, one, one issue we didn't even have time to get into is the whole question of conflating Jews with Israel and uh, the various ways that plays out right. and, and so on. So maybe we'll save that um, for another time. But uh, the other thing, you tweet at, um, I mentioned that your Twitter feed is a, is a good way to keep track of a, of a certain coalition of communities that you kind of uh, represent via retweet. Um, and is that just your name, your Twitter? Yeah, name? at Campius, that's right. At K-A-M as in Mary, P-E-A-S for our um, audio podcast listeners. And I am at Robert Ryder, W-R-I-G-H-T-E-R. So thanks a lot for um, taking the time, Ron. We'll uh, bring you back next time. There's something that uh, people uh, should be wise enough not to talk about in public and, and <laughs> talk about in public. Okay. Right. That's it. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Bye-bye.